Susan Briette is uh, Lum's newest staff member. Susan is uh, with us after spending 26 years on the staff of United States Senator Richard Luger, uh, where she was involved in constituent services and had an expertise in helping uh, the senators um, constituents that had immigration issues. So Susan is an expert <coughs> in immigration. But uh, the other neat thing about Susan is she graduated in 2007 with a uh, Master's of Divinity from Christian Theological Seminary and is that close to ordination in the Presbyterian Church. So, her heart. so without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Susan Briette. I um, would like to begin by reading a couple passages from Genesis with relation to Noah's Ark, obviously. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw that the earth was corrupt, and for all flesh had corrupted in its ways upon earth, on the earth. And God said, to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. Now I am going to destroy them along with the earth. Make yourself an ark of cypress, wood, make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make, to make it, the length of the ark. 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above. And put the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For my part, I am going to bring a flood of waters on the earth to destroy from heaven all flesh in which is is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds according to them their kind, and of the animals according to their kind, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind. Two of every kind shall come to you to keep them alive. Also take with you every kind of food that is eaten, and store it up, and it shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Now Genesis 8, verses 14 through 19. In the second month of the twenty-seventh day of the month, the earth was dry. Then God said to Noah, Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives, and every animal, every creeping thing, and every bird, everything that moves on the earth, went out of the ark by families. I'm in awe when I think about the interdependence and the interdependency of life that surrounds us. It's all around us. It provides insight for me into God's design for creation and God's accommodation for creatures of all colors, shapes, and sizes. In God's plan, diversity is evidence of God's providence. Every single creature is uniquely created by God with a particular purpose, whether it be for aerating the soil, filtering the water, cleaning air, supplying nutrients to the land, managing resources, or maintaining balance in nature. When we look at both science and scripture, we see that in God's providence, all living things are gifts and are necessary in order to flourish. We are blessed with life itself, as well as all that sustains us, including other creatures. Our individual lives are a gift to us and to one another. 
Though the gift of life that God breathed into us and surrounds us, or through this, we are blessed. At the same time, we are a blessing to others. God nourishes us and equips us for the journey. He expects us to speak out and act as our unique selves, and at the same time protect and preserve other creatures so that they may too live into their calling. When all creatures are encouraged to flourish and be their unique selves as God intended, all of creation thrives. Although some creatures, like snakes and spiders, turn our stomachs, every one of us is a gift from God to the other. Aside from the creation story, I cannot think of a better example of God's concern for diversity than the passage about Noah's Ark. It is important to God that the diversity of creation be preserved. The story underscores that in God's eyes, every type of creature is necessary to ensuring that life itself continues. God has obviously given much time and thought, after reading that passage in all the detail, in ensuring that all creatures are accounted for and have the necessary accommodations. Like Adam's relationship with creation, Noah is charged with ensuring that the needs of all the animals and other passengers are met, as well as maintaining the peace. He gives Noah specific instructions on how to build the ark and what provisions to include. While I've always read the story that Noah and his family were saved because he was good, I believe that there is more to the story. God needed someone he could trust that would follow through with his instructions in order for creation and all of its diversity to be saved. God wanted to make sure that the person he put in charge had a proven track record and would put God's will first. Since every creature was unique and served an important purpose in God's kingdom, Noah would be mindful of their needs and ensure that the journey would be a safe one. Since I have shared with you a little bit about the scriptural basis of my presentation tonight, I want to tell you a little bit about my personal experience and why this topic is important to me. Your initial reaction might be to chalk up my bitterness and grief to the Senator's loss in the primary and his forced retirement. However, after much soul searching, I believe it is more than that. Yes, I was very proud of my boss for taking bold stands, such as voting for sanctions against South Africa, asking questions when the U.S. was poised to go to war against Iraq, and championing immigration reform legislation. I also had an affinity for the institution of the Senate itself. And you would be right that the campaign was grueling and painful. Many of the people we thought were our friends ignored us and tried to distance themselves as much as possible from us while other people were abrasive and smug about their dislike for the senator. Still others were afraid about publicly taking a side or didn't care either way. And I'm talking about Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> while I was aware of the nativism and resentment in other states, I thought the marriage between the senator and his constituents was strong and that both were equally committed to one another. The heartbreak and the loss wasn't just about the senator's character, the causes he championed, the ideas he espoused, or even the aspersion cast on the Luger organization itself. As a staff member whose job focused entirely on relationship building and earning the public trust, I felt abandoned and betrayed. Many of the votes and positions for which he was most criticized were the things that I was most proud. In my mind, they were courageous, well-reasoned, and the, and the right in the eyes of God. The slurs and the whisper, cam whisper campaigns that were mounted against us were targeted the senator's civility and thoughtfulness, qualities that seem to be missing in the vibrato that holds so much sway in today's immediate gratification and soundbite culture. Like an investigator trying to solve a theft case, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what happened. How did everything get turned upside down and on its head? I've watched for a number of years as a stench and an ugliness have seeped into public discourse. At one time, members could disagree and still be friends, but now the objective is to put as much distance as possible between you and people who hold different view or belong to a different party. Personal relationships have broken down, making trust a scarce commodity during, diffi during difficult policy negotiations. I have watched as upstanding men and women were defeated by fear mongers who recast their character and positions using viciousness and half-truth. It has prompted me to ask a lot of questions. 
How do we let others define our beliefs and our values? Why has the political arena become more like a minefield than a city on a hill? Why are we so susceptible to messages that appeal to our emotions rather than our minds and purposely try to distort reality? Why do we engage, let alone give credence to messages designed to create myth rather than dispel it or increase an audience share rather than offer an unbiased explanation of the issues? I have a friend who recently told me that something was true because everyone was saying it. He argued the point with me even though I knew it firsthand. <coughs> Why are we so moved by spin and talking in circles rather than honest conversations? Even though we claim not to like all the negativity, why do we reward the people who are doing it with our vote? Why do we tolerate divisiveness when we deserve decisiveness? Our elected officials lead us to believe that our objective should be a winner-take-all and that our zero-sum game approach should be the way to solve every problem. We believe and are encouraged in our beliefs that we should not have to compromise. This so-called sense of entitlement has crept into the way we all think. I would argue that the mindset of mine and me first does not distinguish according to income. Could it be that without being fully aware, we too are complicit in the gridlock and seeding our political institutions to those who for whatever reason are insistent on trashing it and bringing it down? Yes, despite all the complaints about our political system, some of the blame can be directed back at us. We can't check out of our democratic system and expect that our interests will be represented. We too bear responsibility for the hollow banter and banality of our elected officials and the pundits who act as their mouthpieces. After all, if they thought there was any possibility we might withhold our vote, they would not do it. In order to ex Cite the extremes, they are hedging their bets that more moderate voters <coughs> will continue to give their tacit support even if they don't agree with their style. Some of us even expect that our elected officials should launch an all-out media assault on their opponents and verbally knock them around in order to prove that their loyalty or prove their loyalty to a particular party or ideology above and beyond making their position public. This often happened when we would get calls from the senator's office that they were did not know why he did not do more sound bites on TV about a particular position, even though it, it was only used to provoke a particular outcome or response, not to explain the issues. During a heated debate, many of the senator's constituents would suggest that he was soft on a particular position if he would not join in others in taking jabs at the people who disagreed with him. I would even go a step further and suggest that the raucousness our elected officials and an impasse in which they find themselves is a reflection of society. Why do we favor gridlock rather than real problem solving? Instead, doing nothing is the one thing in which we all have agreement. Despite all our grumblings, it is my contention that our elected officials are doing exactly what we want them to do. If we constituents said with real resolve that we were not going to tolerate the uncooperativeness, the obstinacy, and the intractability and instead expected them to thoughtfully address the issues, they would roll up their sleeves and would work with the rest of their colleagues in a meaningful and sincere way. <clears throat> it is no secret that elected officials always have in the back of their minds winning the next election. In his book, Healing the Heart of Democracy, Parker Palmer writes, the will of the people, or the will of we the people, I should say, is key to democracy. If we cannot come together with enough trust to discern the general will, and support leaders who are responsive to it while resisting the rest, we will forfeit the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. I would like to offer up five action items that we can all take to improve the tenor of our current discourse and begin healing the heart of the country. One, we need to honor and respect each other as well as our differences. Everybody is needed at the table, even the Tea Party folks, and the 99%. I'm a firm believer that we are God's gifts to one another. In the same way that God provided for our protection and nourishment, God has planned for our needs by giving us each other to help us navigate obstacles and build bridges when there is no other way to get across. We each possess skills, insights, and abilities 
that are integral to our establishing consensus building and rethinking the possible at the local, state, and federal levels. In addition, we possess various points of views that, when shared, help us to see the big picture. With your permission, I would like five volunteers to help me with the demonstration of how we're better equipped to solve problems when we solicit information from people with different perspectives. Can I have five different people? Everybody kind of circle around the ball. Can you, can you discern what, what, what the ball, what the words are saying, what the message is? Mm -hmm. The whole message? I mean, does well, it look like gobbledygook, or, I mean, like, does it have any context? Well, it looks like phrases of sentences. Yeah. Your, finished thoughts. It says, your dinner is in the oven. <laughs> <laughs> does, does, um, does it make any sense at all what you see in front of you? No. Don't eat the raisins. <laughs> so so no. would you, if you all maybe shared the information. Put in the salad. Okay. <laughs> if you all right. shared the information was in front of you, you think the possibility that it would all kind of come together and make sense? Yes. Do you want to try to think you can, maybe just the first sentence around if that's okay, okay with you guys. Okay. 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 Well, our, ours, what we, I can see is put them in the salad, and then the other, it looks like there's probably a period there, because then it starts, don't eat, but I don't know what I'm not supposed to eat. I think the beginning of that is plan to put them. Plan to put them in the something? No, so don't a, eat the what? That's a period, this is a comma. Oh. So don't eat the... Red, red grapes, grapes, comma. Plan to put I plan to put them in the salad. Right. So don't now I'm going to the red grapes, so it's like a grape salad. I guess so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really think, but but you have the whole but you have the whole sentence this way. I don't eat the grapes. I plan to put them in the salad. But when you looked at it just from your particular vantage point, you didn't have all that information, right? It didn't really make any sense. But when you all came together and saw it from all different perspectives, it made a little bit more sense. Okay, so right. we don't eat the grapes, but we can take the raisins. That's right, that's okay. right, that's right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the last thing is, is um, if, you, if you had that perspective, and to get way down there at the top, and look, it's because it's small writing. Mm -hmm. I'll to read that. Oh, my eight, please. Me some chicken. Leave Fear me some me. chicken. Leave me. Yeah, leave me some chicken. Right, right. But you had to change your perspective to be able to see that, right? So, but now you have the whole story, so by, you know, by looking at it with other people and cooperating to get the whole story in different perspectives. And yeah. that's why it's so important that the diversity, yeah. we maintain that, because we wouldn't have all those perspectives if we didn't have different experiences and places to start from. So thank you guys very, very, very much for your... When I suggest that we welcome everyone, you realize that means even the people we find extremely hard to like. For me, it's the Tea Party members. For others, it might be labor unions or trial lawyers or the natural gas industry or chemical companies. When we recognize people as gifts rather than obstacles, we are more likely to share our stories and find common ground. As a result, we are more inclined to cooperate and compromise. By having more information about the experiences and needs of others, we discover that we have more options and flexibility in negotiating policies and acknowledge that acknowledge all the stakeholders. Again, we discover that we have more options and flexibility in negotiating policies that acknowledge all of the stakeholders. In the heart of democracy, Parker Palmer writes, violence comes in many forms, from spiritual to physical, and every form is rooted in the failure of compassion, a lack of empathy and respect. The broken, open, tension-holding heart is not only a powerful source of compassion and healing, it is also a source of the wisdom required to make challenging decisions. Number two, we must lead with our hearts. We must always remind ourselves that the hopes, fears, dreams of all of us are tied up in public life. I'm quoting here again from the heart of democracy. The impulse that makes democracy possible and those that threaten it originate in the heart. With its, complex mix of, with its complex mix of heedless self-interest and yearning for community. We need to treat politics or public life with respect and honor. I almost wonder if there might be some element of sacred about it, insofar as it, it comprises us all. Palmer writes, looking at politics through the eye of the heart 
can liberate us from seeing it as a chess game of moves and counter moves, or a shell game for seizing power, or a blame game of whack-a-mole. Rightly understood, politics is no game at all. It is the ancient and honorable human endeavor of creating a community in which the weak as well as the strong can flourish. Love and power can collaborate, and justice and mercy can have their day. We, the people, must build a political life rooted in the commonwealth of compassion and creativity still found among us, becoming a civic community sufficiently united to know our one will and hold those who govern it accountable to it. Though our public confession in schools and sporting events, or through our, excuse me, our public confession in schools and sporting events, our participation in public life is a pledge to one another, much like a marriage. We need to temper our words and be intentional when engaging each other in politics in much the same way we strive to be with our families. Lincoln echoed these concerns in his appeal from his second inaugural address. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have been strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic chords of memory will swell when a gun touched, as surely they will be by the better angels of our nature. Number three, we have to be faithful. We must remain engaged in public life. As was mentioned earlier, the input we have to offer by telling our stories and giving expression to the stories of others is critical to making laws and policies that will help us all to flourish. In order to be upright and follow through with our commitment to God and our fellow citizens, we must participate in the political process. Citizenship is a way of being in the world rooted in the knowledge that I am a member of a vast community of human and non-human beings that I depend on for the essentials I could never provide for myself. Are we faithful to the eternal conversation of the human race, to speaking and listening in a way that takes us closer to the truth? Are we faithful to the call of courage that summons us to witness to the common good, even against great odds? Parker Palmer points out, that when faithfulness is our standard, we are most likely to sustain engagement with tasks that will never end, doing justice, loving mercy, and calling the beloved community into being. Full engagement in a movement called democracy requires no less of us than the full engagement in the living of our lives. Part of what it means to be faithful and engaged is to be discerning consumers of information. We must, we must analyze the information we receive, comparing and contrasting it not only to other sources, but we must apply it to our own understanding of the world and beliefs, our beliefs, to what we hear and to what we read. Not only is it incumbent on us to be critical in the way we receive and process information, but we must also require our elected officials to engage us in a manner that is honest and respectful. We must send the message that we expect to be treated like a thoughtful, intelligent people that we are and are capable of receiving information without being entertained. Senator Luger warned in his commence commencement for address at Hanover College in 1978, the unfortunate truth in public and private life is that the bulk of words have become nonsense. What might have been evaluated as abnormal conduct in other times and circumstances may now hold increasing importance as an imperative of public and private life which otherwise begins to approximate the biblical Tower of Babel, or the philosopher's definition of nonsense. God may be listening too. There are inherent risks to being engaged in embodying the power we possess as individual citizens, regardless of, in regardless of income, education, or life experiences, to be self-determining. We owe it to ourselves and to each other to be part of the conversation. Howard Zimmon wrote, The essential ingredients of all struggles for justice are human beings, who if only for a moment, if only while beset with fears, step out of line and do something, however small. And even the smallest, most unheroic acts adds to the store of kindling that might be ignited by some surprising circumstance into tumultuous change. The last aspect of 
being faithful according, especially to a God who has a preference for those in the margins, is to ensure that we bring people to the table who might otherwise not have the luxuries of time and resources and make it safe for them to be there. If we have faith, we have hope. If we have hope, we will be able to trust. And if we have trust, we can begin the healing process. But once we're able to forgive, we'll be able to be liberated from the hubris that cripples our relationships and our decision making. Borrowing from one of the questions asked in the Presbyterian Church USA ordination service, by asking for forgiveness and forgiving others, we are better to equipped to further the peace and the unity of our cherished democracy and to draw upon our energy, intelligence, imagination, and love in our decision making. Number five, we must take the initiative to be the concrete or the patch that holds our democracy together. We have to be the patch that is necessary to begin the difficult and painful work of reconciliation. This requires that we balance our own needs and the right to be heard on the issues with the needs and the rights of others. At the same time, we must work at maintaining the threads of affection and goodwill that bind us and require our allegiance. Um, it struck me what it says here is reparation concrete. And that I never really put the words repair and reparation together until I was looking at that and what concrete means. And so I thought it might be um, important to talk about and use that as an image for how we be the patch for each other. Um, it, like I said, um, while I understand that reparation focuses on human rights, because I don't know if you can see it or not, but it says reparation, and that's in Spanish, but it's very similar to reparation, I believe, probably, that we use with regards to um, human justice violations. But I understand there's a difference between them. I believe they're both rooted in that sense of idea of repair. And I believe that they're related to making right or taking it one step further to be upright. For those among us who are Christians, Christ is the ultimate top and bond. That's the brand name there. <laughs> Grafting us to God and to one another. Whatever religion we prescribe to, even if it's just the fidelity to one another, we have a responsibility to be the olive branch for one another, or if you prefer, the patch and the whole of the heart of our democracy. As we think what it means to be the concrete, I would leave you with the following quote. Learning how to hold individualism and communalism and creative tension with each other, allowing each to check the other's darkest potential, is a key democratic habit of the heart. Our democratic institutions must be inhabited by citizens and citizen leaders who know how to hold conflict inwardly in a manner that converts it into creativity, allowing it to pull them open to new ideas, new courses of action, and each other. That kind of tension holding is the work of the well-tempered heart. If I, were to, if I were asked for two words to summarize the habits of the heart American citizens need in response to 21st century conditions, chutzpah and humility are the words I would choose. Chutzpah, I mean knowing a voice, knowing that I have a voice that needs to be heard and the right to speak it. By humility, I mean accepting the fact that my truth is always partial and may not be true at all. So I need to listen with openness and respect, especially to the other, as I need to speak my own voice with clarity and conviction. These are my conclusions. I invite you to ponder the same, and I'm really interested in hearing your thoughts and, uh, and continuing the conversation, and hopefully we can make our our public life and our public discourse better and um, really solve problems for our future and um, so that we all again flourish. Thank you again for your time to be here. Thank you. Thank you.